So I'm 16 years old. I just finished my sophomore year of high school, and it was rough, to say the least. As a 16-year-old, it's a big deal when you lose friends, and when you lose your girlfriend, and when you lose your best friend to drugs, and all of this stuff. And at the end of the year, I remember feeling so alone, struggling with depression, crying myself to sleep at night, not really knowing what's next and where to go next. Knowing that the Lord and that my relationship with Jesus is something that needs to take a higher priority in my life, but not really knowing how to get there. And so at the end of the year, I find myself ready to be done, ready to get away from friends, not excited to spend the summer seeing tons and tons of friends, but I just needed a break. So me and my parents went on a vacation, and we're flying to North Carolina to visit some grandparents, and I'm I had just thrown this book that my parents had given me a few years before, and, and I'm reading it on the plane, and I remember getting to page 74 and reading this paragraph that talked about how with, through the power of the Holy Spirit, we have the ability to rise up and say, yes, I've been wounded, I've been hurt, I've been abused, I've been mistreated, but through the power of the Holy Spirit, I have the ability to stand up and say, I want to know Jesus more than I want to be ruled by my own pain. And I had this moment where I realized, I, I've been hurt. I feel like I've been wounded, and I need to embrace that, but that I don't want to let this pain define me. That can't be what defines me. So a few nights later, I remember I'm, I'm up at my grandparents' house, and I'm sitting on the end of my bed, and it's like 2 in the morning, and Again, I kind of hit that cycle of going to love Jesus, and then two years later, it's like rock bottom. I feel like my world's falling apart. Kind of this roller, I guess we're kind of, what did, I just lost the term. Roller coaster. Roller coaster. There we go. <laughs> Good job. Uh, I just want some interaction there. So this roller coaster life that we've all seen. And I remember I'm up and I'm crying and it's like I never had that moment with the Lord a few nights before. I remember leaning back and as soon as my head hits the pillow, I see this vision. Which was cool because I thought that visions were just something for really strong Christians. And I see this vision and I'm kind of confused. And it was like I was in this helicopter and I was kind of flying around from this aerial view and the, the roofs of auditoriums were being like peeled off and I could see into them and see them packed full of young people. And it was one of those moments where I knew that what I was seeing, I knew that it was a student-run movement. That it wasn't just one really big youth group, but there were students coming together regularly to say that we are more passionate about pursuing Jesus than we are about protecting our own little borders, our own little walls. And so... I kind of come out of this vision and I'm confused. I'm kind of wondering why the Lord delivered mail to the wrong person. And I'm realizing that he just gave some vision that he probably meant for this 45-year-old youth pastor who's been doing it for 22 years and he accidentally gave it to a depressed 16-year-old. And I remember opening up my prayer journal and writing down, okay, I just saw this vision of a youth ministry. It started by students rallying students together. Uh, couple times a year, and I think you might want me to do something about it, but I'm not going to say anything until you confirm it. And so over the next few weeks, I was just praying and churning through this and learning about the heart of unity, and uh, in John 17, there is this scripture about unity that really struck me. Uh, and it says, I have given them, Jesus is saying, I've given them the glory that you gave me, that they may be one as we are one. I am them and you and me, so that they may be brought to complete unity. Then the world will know that you sent me, and have loved them even as you have loved me. I remember reading this verse and realizing that unity is not just something that we should optimistically set our eyes on, but that it's actually a necessary part of world evangelization. It's actually a precursor to the world knowing glory of God. That Jesus is praying to God and he's saying that I have given them what you've given me so they might be unified. So that any unified state of the church might actually know 
who the Father is. And we run away from unity. It's really easy to run away. Some of the main ways that I've seen that we run away from unity is, one, we don't think it's necessary. And this is a little bit of a stereotype, but usually the people that run into this are kind of the big, bigger dogs in youth ministry, the ones that have the ability to be self-sustaining. And it's easy once we're in a self-sustaining ministry, we have the resources that we need to not feel like we need other people, to not feel like we need to work with other churches. Because we can work on our own, and we can work by ourselves, and we get on the mission trips, we get to the retreats, we have the cool events. And another way that we usually kind of avoid or run from unity is because we don't think it's possible. This is a mentality that is more common amongst the smaller guys. That you have a youth group of 10 people and you don't think it's possible to be unified when there's a youth group of 200 in your city. And you don't think it's possible to be unified with the different denominations down the street. And so it's super easy to avoid unity and just kind of put it into this realm of an optimistic thing that might happen in the future. And if it does, then I want to be a part of it. But it's, it's not really possible because we're just something small. Another reason that we don't like doing it is because we just we don't know how. It just seems complicated. It just seems messy. I mean, all of us know that there's different denominations and different backgrounds and different, different stories that come with every church. And it just seems like that would be messy. That would be really difficult. And so we don't even want to touch it. I remember really running into this early on, realizing that this was going to be difficult. Realizing that if I would have known all that that vision meant when I started running towards it, I probably wouldn't have done it. But the Lord sometimes keeps us naive to the gravity of our dreams. And then we get into them and we start seeing the fruit. We start seeing the reward. But then we also start seeing the difficulty. We start seeing that it's more difficult than we thought, but it's also more rewarding than we thought so we can go forward. And as a 16-year-old, I remember for the next few weeks after that vision, beginning to pursue this, saying, I don't, I don't know how to do this, but I feel like I'm supposed to, and so we're going to try. And so I did what I, it, the Holy Spirit was so involved with giving me a grace to understand how in the world to start a ministry as a 16-year-old. And I was amazed to look at um, all of these things in my life over the last several years that all of a sudden were beginning to make sense. All of these connections, all these relationships that were beginning to make sense to where the Lord was preparing me for this, preparing our city for this for, for years before I even had any idea what was going on. And I remember after about six months, we had had three events, all of which had probably around, I think the smallest one was around 175 students, and the largest one was around 325 in that first six months. And I remember going to school the day after an event, so excited. Because I was just I was just replaying stories of students' lives that I talked to that night that had been changed, and uh, just replaying the moments of worship and the moments of seeing churches come together to worship and to say that Jesus is more important than our differences. And I get a text from one of my friends that says, "Hey, check your email. My pastor just forwarded this to me to our whole church." And this pastor had just sent an email to his church, and we had called the ministry thirst. And the title of his email was, Why I'm Not Thirsty Anymore. And he sent an email to his whole church saying why they should never go to these thirst events at all. And so I'm 16, and I'm like, okay. <laughs> I was just like, that was the first moment that I really realized. I was like, I don't know if I can do this. And I remember this pastor, he had pretty much just had some doctrinal differences with something that one of the one of the um, speakers had said. And even though his youth had been coming for years and loved it, he didn't want to do it. He, 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 did, he wanted to pull his community out. And I remember sitting down and praying, and I got one of the other youth pastors that was kind of on our board for the ministry. And I called him and I said, hey, can, will you mind taking this pastor out to coffee with me? Because I just felt like we needed to talk about it. And so we took him out to coffee, and we just sat down, and I remember I so badly wanted to say, you know, what's your problem? What's your deal? And I remember we just asked him, what do you, what do you think? What, what do you think about unity in our city? Just having that conversation rather than just 
going straight to the differences. Uh, and that was an extremely healing time. Even though it was difficult and I wanted to quit, really seeing that just trying to do something can be beneficial. And so we have this problem where we think that it's too difficult. We think that it's not worth it. And what I want to say to you guys today is that it can't just be, unity can't just be as optimistic, hopeful item that might happen in the future, this thing or this movement that might happen, but that we have to realize that it's actually necessary. We have to believe that it's necessary. When we read scripture, we have to read that and really, really show that we cannot reach our city without being unified. It's been amazing um, over the last eight years to see what God has done through Thirst United as we've been involved. And uh, now looking back, it's way bigger, and I don't mean bigger in numbers, I mean bigger in like impact and significance than I ever, ever imagined as a 16 year old. I would have been scared and ran away real quick if I would have known all that the Lord was going to do. And seeing uh, there's been over 35 different events at different churches, all reaching uh, three, 500 students and probably 20 churches in the area that are involved. And it hasn't been about uniformity. I think that's a misconception that we have. And so I, th- I think that as we go forward as youth ministers, as we go forward and back to our cities, I don't think that when we read about unity, we need to say we all need to be the same. But it's a respect and it's knowing that we're all on the same journey. And if we're all on the same journey, if we're all walking towards the same Savior, trying to reach the same kids, let's figure out ways to walk together. So if you don't think it's possible, or if you think it's too hard, or you just don't know how, I want to encourage you, try. Believe that it's possible. And let's go out and let's know that if we're going on the same journey, if we're moving towards the same direction, why not go together? Thank you.